Anybody say that today? That his goodness is running after you. And now don't miss that last part. We don't mind being chased. <laughs> but there also comes a point that we must surrender. Mm -hmm. Amen. Surrender everything. Did y'all hear that in the song? Have you gotten to that point that you can say, Lord, I surrender all? I give it to you all. Amen. We've come to this portion of our service where it is most important that we hear the preached word. Yes. As I have said years ago, I went to a few concerts and they had uh, some other folks come out and then they got to the to the main part. Now I'm not presenting to you that I am the main act at all. But what I am presenting to you is that God's word is paramount above all. So you're in the right place at the right time to hear from heaven. Not what Christian says, but what the Lord himself has said. Amen. If you stand to your feet today, there is this finale, this final message in this series. I pray you've been blessed uh, in the series that is changed into his image. We've been with this since the last Sunday in December, and here we are coming into Easter season, and we, the Lord is uh, going to be leading us in uh, towards that topic, but we want to finalize and bring a point here to these final, these messages. And this message today, if I were to give it a title, Certainly the Lord has spoken. Change in Christ's Amen. church. Amen. Change in Christ's church. The word of God says in three separate locations. We'll connect the dots in just a second. Jesus had come into the coast of Caesarea Philippi. And he asked his disciples a very important question. He says, who do, son, who do men say that I, the son of man, mm -hmm. am? Peter speaks up finally afterwards. Uh, he speaks up and says that um, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. Sister Penny, someone's at the door. Um, Acts 431, if you'll turn there with me, please. Acts 4.31, and it reads, this is our theme for our association. It's a wonderful scripture that says, Acts 4.31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Amen. And then finally, if you'll turn to our third verse today, in which we will be bringing this message from the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ to John. Jesus speaks words in John in Revelation 3, verse 20. Say that, Revelation 3, verse 20. Verse 20. And he says, Behold, I stand at the door. <laughs> You're right on time, Renee. <laughs> and knock, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. <laughs> wow. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. That denotes that if you let Jesus in to the church, there's change that's bound to happen. Amen. Father, we stand in the midst of your holiness and we thank you, Lord, for your word. Your word.
word. The grass withers, the flower fades, but your word shall stand forever. You preach now, Lord. Use this old, weak, clay vessel to declare your glorious truth to your sheep. In Jesus' name. You may be seated in his presence. Tell somebody near you, I'm glad to see you today. It's a good day. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. I love you, Pink Creek. God bless you. I, I was around nine years old, sitting on my Aunt Hazel's porch. And... Uh, waiting on my mom to pick me up, I would imagine. I stayed there sometime with other kids that were in the neighborhood. She lived over there on Fourth Avenue. I still see that old metal settee glider with those, that, those faded flower cushions that would crack sometimes after you had them so long. And if you sat on wrong, they'd get your legs and you had shorts on. Y'all know what I'm talking about. In the 70s and 80s uh, technology. <laughs> That glider, but as we were sitting there, she was just sitting there, she fan or whatever, uh, have a fly swatter. As folks used to port set, that's what they used to do. And uh, she asked me an interesting question. She said to me, "When Christian, when are you going to join the church?" I was about nine years old, so I looked at her and immediately. I got a big gulp in my throat and. Because, you know, joining the church, my goodness, you had to walk down the aisle. You had to say some things to the preacher. You had to stand up in front of folks and you had to do all these things. She said, when are you going to join the church? I don't really remember what I said. I don't know if I said anything. Now, she had the right intent in her heart, but the wrong wording and borderline uh, incorrect theology. For many, joining the church means coming and attending and doing the activities and going through the rituals and, and countless have joined church but seen no change. Amen. The question is, and the question that I believe she was really trying to get to was this, and, and correct me or, or, or say amen, don't correct me. Say amen if you have heard this and have experiences. Have you called on Jesus to save you? Have you accepted his free gift of salvation? Have you turned to him as Savior and Lord? And in turning to him, you turn from sin. That's called repentance. And are you trusting fully in him right now for salvation? That's the question. Not have you joined the church. Church, there has to be a change. We have tried, I have tried in these messages as we have gone back and looked at these. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. Change happens there. The Holy Spirit is the leader of change. There is freedom in changing. God gives us more freedom than we ever knew we are living epistles, letters before the world to read about change that is actually happening and is correct and is good. We go through trials sometimes, amen, as we change and don't often look at, at the trial as something that is because you have been bad, but maybe, just maybe, it's because God is drawing you closer and making you look more like his son, amen? We see, we need to learn to see that change is looking through heaven's eyes. Last week, we talked about the fact that we need to change in our worship. And we looked at the woman at the well. This shows us the true meaning of worshiping our Savior. And today, all of this bundled together, if we do these things that Scripture has lined out, there can be, there will be, there is change happening in the church. Two months into this new year, Pancre, have you seen some change in your life? Have you seen change? Have you noticed a difference? You see, the point is too long, and if we're not careful, we, if we can get used to just coming and doing this. Sitting down, participating in 
whatever happens between 11 and 1230. Yeah. And then do this, go out the door and do us. Let's not get caught in that dangerous cycle. The Lord literally wants to churn you. Y'all, I use the old term. Come on, buttermilk folks. Churn you from the inside out. Now, preacher, I don't like that type of preaching. Make me feel good, but don't tell me about myself. Well, I'm here to tell you, he told me about me for he just telling you about you. He wants to churn you from the inside out. We, and we, we must be careful that we don't make these changes about what we want to see in our life. See, we put ourselves in the mix. Well, I want to see this happen in my life. We got to make it about what God is doing in our lives. He, he, he's got a plan for you today. And maybe he hasn't shown you all that plan. Maybe he hasn't spoken to you about all that plan. Maybe he hasn't fully shown you, but that doesn't mean he doesn't have a plan. Amen. So looking at these texts and connecting the dots, if you pray with me for just a little while, y'all praying? We are living in the church age. Now keep in mind, the age of the church, the advent of Pentecost from up to, to then until this point, the rapture when Jesus returns for his church, that is called the church age, approximately 2,000 years of history. And, and countless millions in the church, and, and when I say the church, I'm talking about Jesus' church, but then there are those that have been in the church, whether it be the church of their own making or the church that has been presented to the world. Millions have labored, they have worked, they have routined, they have they have gone through the rituals. They, they have attended. Notice I'm mixing the good with the bad. They, they have preached. They have sacrificed. They have prayed. They have sang. They have come. They have left. They have joined. They have quit. They have worshipped. They have gone. They have come. They have left. They have masqueraded. They have played. They have prayed again. They have persecuted, been persecuted, mentored, gone through the motions, slept in church, eaten in church, been entertained in church, been challenged in church, but hopefully somebody along this 2,000 years has been transformed in church. I tried to hit the whole spectrum because, see, in this message and in that, that, that mix there, get this, I'm in there. I'm in there. How, how about you? I, I'll be honest with you. There have been some times in my life, and not, not any time of recent, but times in my life, as I look back over my life, I was playing church at times. Amen. There have been times I have worshipped. There's been times that I got just locked in a routine of coming and going and coming and going. Well, it's time, to it's time for church. Why is it time for church? Well, that's just been the time that I've gone all my life. That's, that's where I'm going to get this. The church is not just in these four walls. You can have church at your household. You can have church at your job. You can have church in your car. You take the church. You are the church. You're the one that the Lord has filled with his precious. Holy Spirit. So could it be what I'm about to say? Could it be that over these last 2,000 years we've made church into something it was not supposed to be? I want you to know Satan's a liar. The devil, he is a liar and he is a great counterfeiter and he knows how to take the Lord's church and bring something along beside it that looks like church. Yeah. 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 So we've seen change doctrines. We've seen people change who God is and who Jesus is and what sin is and what salvation is and what the church is and what heaven is and what hell is to the point nowadays People will tell you there is no heaven. There is no hell. Let me stand flat-footed and tell you this morning, there is a heaven. Yes, Lord. And there is a hell. And you will either go to one or the other. So, as
has Jesus stepping on a cloud in the book of Matthew. It takes up in Acts. It's also recorded in the other gospel. He tells his disciples to be his witnesses. John was the last disciple and it's recorded that he was sent. This is where Revelation takes up to the desolate, forsaken isle of Patmos. And there John sees Christ and Christ tells John to write all that he will show him and shows him. And the first thing he tells John is a reminder of who he is, who Jesus is. Look at what he says. If you have your book, your Bible's open, Revelation, the first chapter, verse 17. And it says, and when John records, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet. Praise the Lord. As dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Praise the Lord. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, get this, I am alive forevermore. Amen. We're in the right place, church. I serve a risen Savior. Y'all believe that today? He's alive. He's, he's not dead. It's good to John. John writes it down. John says, amen. And then Jesus says, and I have what? The keys of Hades and death. So get this. Don't, don't miss this. This is for free. Even the devil's own pad don't belong to the devil. Amen. The Lord owns the devil's house. He owns Hades. He owns hell. He, he owns death. He owns the grave. He owns it. Jesus is the greatest of all time. Yeah. Now watch this. Don't, don't miss this. The second thing Christ tells John is to write these messages to the church. Yeah. To the churches. To write these things that you have seen and the things which you are. You move on down past verse 17. You'll see this. And things which will take place after this. He says, then the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels, heavenly messengers with a message to the seven churches. And then the seven lampstands are seven churches. Amen. Now, I, I want to stop and remind you that you all know that I teach. And as a teacher, administrators will sometimes yeah, we got some teachers in here today will pop into your classroom to have a look at you, to see what you're doing, to see what you're going through. Uh, sometimes they will come, don't miss this, unannounced, and they will come to observe your classroom. How are you handling discipline? How are you teaching? And, and the growth that is happening or the growth that is not happening in your class. Now, their assessments can be spot on or they can be flawed because they're people. But watch this. Nevertheless, a report is made. In my file, I got my reports where my various administrators, and if I'm thinking correctly, I've had three or four over the years, and, and the various administrators have, have come in and observed my classrooms. All right? Now, here's the point. Jesus is the great administrator. And, and don't miss this. His assessments are always spot on. You see, I could argue with a person and say, well, now that's not real, what was really happening. That's, that's not how it went. I, I don't quite agree with your assessment. But I can't say that to Christ because he's perfect. So Jesus gives, get, get this, an assessment to each of the seven churches in Asia Minor. They go right around that area. Each of the seven churches and his assessment is spot on and his assessments speak to us today. You can say it this way. He don't miss anything. Y'all ever had an old person tell you that? You may think that I didn't see you but I did. My mom would tell me that. I, I hated to hear that. You ain't seen me. I was around the corner. What she was saying is, if I didn't see you, somebody I know saw you. Can I tell you, Jesus is omniscient. Do y'all believe it? Do you believe it? He sits high and looks low. He sees everything. He knows everything. 
So if that is the case, it is important to hear what Jesus, the founder and the foundation and the future of the church says to the churches. Now, I want to pause for just a moment and I'm not going to get into theological debates and, and theological arguments today. Do these seven churches represent the ages that have gone over these 2,000 years? There are some arguments for that. Or do they just represent just those specific seven churches during John's time? Or are they presenting certain characteristics of certain churches at different times? I'm here to tell you he's talking to his church. Amen. But you don't want to miss this part that seven is a number of completion. Amen. How do you know that, Pastor? Well, six days. Y'all believe it, don't you? God created the heavens. And on the seventh day, he what? Now, not because he was tired, but because he was finished. Y'all see that? He was finished. So whether this means church history or specific churches, the point is this. He's speaking to his church. Now, let, let, let's address the elephant in the room. Most people will steer away from Revelation. Because that's a book that... Don't, don't, don't start talking about that. Because that scares folks. And they get quiet like y'all are now. Or you're that mean that looks out and says, this me looking out today to see which chapter of Revelation we're in. See what's happening in the world. Can you, can you understand this and grasp a hold of this? And I, I, this really blessed me as I studied this this week. Here it is. The book of Revelation is meant to be a blessing to the church. It is, here it is. It is an encouragement to the church. So don't just look at seeing, well, well, where are we? And I'm not going to be speaking on the Antichrist today or speaking on the beasts that come up out of the sea. You can read that on your own and get scared if you want to. But here's the idea. You need to understand what the Lord says throughout this whole book should be an encouragement to his people. Right. Amen. 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 So look at the words. And Jesus said himself in Luke, the 18th chapter, verse 8. This is an amazing verse. Write this down somewhere. Luke 18, verse 8. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? What a question. Wow. What a question. When he comes. So we sang this morning, and I didn't tell Lene which songs to pick. When he comes, I shall be like him. I didn't tell Abby which song to pick out. I didn't tell the group which song to sing. But when he comes, Jesus said, when I come, will I find faith on earth? Amen. If he does, and I believe he will, it should start first in his church. Amen. So look at these messages that Jesus speaks. And they are found in the totality of, of chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation. Write that down. And then I believe that there are some words of change that can be uh, noticed here in these books. Amen. Let's pause for a second and make sure you realize there are seven of them. Amen. The first one. Go to it. Revelation, the second chapter. Verse 1. Quickly, he's speaking to the church at Ephesus. And, and, and he says, watch this, you have left your first love. Hello, somebody. Y'all done got quiet now, ain't you? Now notice, he did not say you've lost your first love. He said you left your first love. Now, now Ephesus was a church, and, and get this, that was nicknamed by theologians as we look throughout the years, the loveless church. So we need to, to be mindful that Jesus has told us that the love of Christ anywhere else, if it's not anywhere else, it should abound where? In the church. Because we have the love of Christ in us, 
The love of Jesus should abound. When people come through these doors, they should feel the love of the Lord. If they don't feel anything else, they should feel the love of the Lord. And that should be enough because that the love of the Lord will make them feel welcomed. Amen. The love of the Lord will make them feel connected. The love of the Lord will draw them in. The love of, of Christ will convict you. Amen, somebody. So if you love Jesus, then what Jesus is really saying, if you love me, stay with me. Don't walk away from me. Don't leave me. Jarrell and I just took a reel out a couple of weeks ago or last week, whenever, to the reservoir at Rye Graham. And he had to have a change of scenery. So we're out here, out there walking him and, and he's trotting along. And I looked over the Rye Reservoir and I saw a little spot there. Now, now I'm, I'm not trying to embarrass her today, but, 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 but I may. And I remember going there with my wife before we were married and that's where we held hands. <laughs> Amen, somebody. And I thought about that spot there. Y'all y'all get, get, get with me for just a second. I thought about that spot, and I remember, uh, uh, that's where I remember that I felt love for her. Hello, somebody. Do you remember the time when you fell in love? I'm asking you a question. Now it gets quiet, amen. Y'all was loud early when the singing was going on, and but now we start asking questions and folks start dropping heads and, 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 and finding stuff in their purse. And I'm asking you a question. Do you remember when you fell in love? I'm not talking about with that significant other that you may be with or are with. I'm talking about with Jesus. Do you remember when you fell in love with the Lord? Do you remember how you felt? When you knew that he loved you more than you could comprehend. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. You remember the time when you fell in love? That love that comes from that relationship if we're not careful, church, we can get so into routines. We can get so into the stuff that we want to do. We can walk away. We can leave. We can leave our first love. John 17 clearly declares, and the writer said it himself, they will know us by our love. So if change will happen in the church, we have to remember who loves us and love the same way. He moves on quickly, and there's no way I can go into depth with all these. This would take a comprehensive study. We've already been through that. If you want to look at it, go find the videos online, and we've done these studies in depth. But look at the second church, second chapter, Revelation, Smyrna. Smyrna is where we, we get the word myrrh. It's a bitter uh, uh, herb or perfume that was used. Myrrh, and that's where the word Smyrna comes from. So this church was called Smyrna, which means the suffering church. Now, that, that does not ring a bell today because a lot of folks are preaching that if you're in the church, you shouldn't suffer. But Jesus in his word says otherwise. Y'all agree? The church suffers, but the church has to persevere. The, the church suffers persecution and trial. If you don't believe me, talk to Job. Talk to Peter. Talk to the disciples that all lost their lives. But notice this. The trials that come our way many times today are, syn are not synonymous with what people say the church is. So therefore, there has to be a disconnect. Smyrna was the suffering church. It was going through persecution. Why? Because it was holding up the truth. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. It's, it, it, sometimes we look at trial and say, well, that's for somebody else. That's, that's not for me. I'm not going through it. I'm more than a conqueror. I, I'm, I'm already winning. I'm a winner in Jesus Christ. I deserve the Christ. I'm the head, not the tail. All these phrases people will throw out there. But Jesus says, if those who suffer with me will reign with me. Amen. Suffering uh, characterized this church. Poverty, attack, 
characterized this church. That's not being preached today. About like we are now. If I get up and preach and say you will be attacked, that's going to uh, thin out some folks. Amen. If I get up and preach that you're going to suffer, that's going to thin out some folks. If I get up and say you're going to go through poverty, that's going to thin out some folks. But if I get up here and say come to church and sow a seed and give the preacher your offering and you'll be blessed a thousand times over. Folks will be like, wait a minute, let me try that. Let me see. And the pews might fill up if I preach a prosperity gospel and not a suffering gospel. I want you to know that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords did not hang on the cross in a king's robe and a king's crown. He hung there naked in poverty, suffering, and in anguish. Could it be the God who is shaping you so that you might be able to reach someone else allows you to go through this suffering so that you might connect with that one person that I can or he can or she can because of the trial you went through. It was not just for you, but for somebody else. That's the beauty of the church, church. Is that God allows us to go through things and you thought that the hell that you endured was because you did something wrong. Or you thought that what you went through was because you were being punished. But maybe it was because God will use it to draw somebody else closer to him. So the Lord Jesus tells this church, trust me in all that you go through. And there is a crown of life waiting for you. Amen. The third church, really fast, Pergamos, Revelation 2, 12 through 17. And this is where it gets interesting. Yeah, we can leave our first love and come back. And yeah, we can suffer and go through some things. But when the preacher starts talking about false teaching, and again, it can get rough. Watch this. Jesus says, he calls it out. He says, you got to deal with false doctrine. You got to deal with false doctrine teaching. Jesus says strong words like, I know where Satan's seat is. Whew. I know where he's sitting. Amen. I know what he's up to. I know how Satan likes to set up shop in the church. Pergamos was the compromising church. I wish I had a witness. He, he, he points out that you cannot compromise. Amen, somebody. You cannot compromise the truth of God. And, and churches all over our country are dropping what they believe and dropping the word of God and say, let's try some of this. And Jesus is saying, I know where Satan's seat is. Yeah. This church, Pergamos, had false teaching in its midst. And they had right teaching that had gone wrong. They had grown, get this strong word that's in the text, but verses 12 through 17. They had grown diluted. Nobody likes diluted drink. I'm, I'm going to go old school for just a moment and only a few of you in here might know what I'm talking about. But nobody wanted some Kool-Aid that was just half made. Come on, Sister Sharon. You came in after a hot day. Amen, I see you. After a hot day outside playing and mama fixed you up, you went in that cabinet. I can still see that cabinet. Pulled out that purple packet and shook it like this and then put that packet. She didn't put half that packet in that old Tupperware container. She poured some sugar down in there and you wanted it to taste good. Nobody wanted any half diluted Kool-Aid. So why do we want a half diluted church? That has half deluded truth and have half deluded sanctification and half deluded salvation and half deluded redemption and half deluded regeneration. But why do you want that? You want the full stuff, all taste, and see that the Lord, He is good. So we got to call false doctrine out. It's not in the midst. We're going to tell it. But what it is, there's only hope in Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus is saying here to the church at Pergamos, don't you lose your identity in me. 
He says, maintain my truth. Don't forget my cross. And our goal is to simply point people to the cross of Calvary, to point Jesus, point them to Jesus, the Christ, the Savior. He's the only way. Amen. Move on quickly. Next church, right on the same line, Jesus keeps coming down the road. Amen. And he says to the church at Thyatira, and he's saying to us today, he says to this adulterous church. He warned them that false teaching can come in, but don't tolerate it. You see, Pergamos had allowed it in, but Thyatira had let it stay. Hello, somebody. There's a difference in it showing up. We know it's going to show up, but there's also a difference in letting it stay. You know what? Something can show up at your house, but you don't have to keep it there. Somebody can show up at your house, but you don't have to let them lie down in the bed where you are. Amen, somebody. Somebody can show up, but you can kindly show them the door. Thyatira, the adulterous church, he warned them about tolerating false teachers. Amen. And it's one thing to know it, but it's quite another to allow it in and around and to remain in the pews, to remain, come on preachers, to remain amongst the flock. Now, I, I thought about this earlier in the week. Paul said it this way. He said, mark them that cause division among you. The problem in America today is, and I've noticed this, and you can see, get your cell phones out, don't get them out right now, but, but get them out later. And look, we got a lot of buffet churches. I've spoken about this. We've got a lot of churches that serve a full buffet. And I begin to think about this just on a, a secular, regular level. Many a well-meaning restaurant has tried this. You can think of some probably more than I could. And they have tried to serve a food that they don't specialize in. Now, if I go to McDonald's, and I haven't been in a while, but if I go to McDonald's, I didn't go there to get a pizza. I went there to get a Big Mac. I went there to get a double quarter pounder. I'm making you hungry with cheese. I went there to get a six piece, a, a 20 piece, whatever. I went there to get their hot, steamy, crispy fries. With a, here you go, Danny, with a Coke. Amen. I did not go to get a pizza. So it makes no sense that MCDs, amen, Mickey D's with the arches would serve pizza. It makes no sense that KFC start trying to serve pizza. They specialize in chicken. It makes no sense to me that Arby has a hamburger. Maybe you like them, but when I go to Arby, I don't want hamburger beef. I want roast beef. <laughs> so it makes no sense, church, that we're trying to serve up anything and everything but the gospel of Jesus Christ. I hope you came here today to hear the gospel, to hear about Jesus and him crucified. I don't want to throw anybody off track. Be it known here, if you show up here, the gospel is on our menu. Amen. It's the only thing we can serve. But I don't know what else to preach. All I know is what saved me. Amen. Jesus Christ. We're not into self-help and motivational jargon and all the bells and whistles that make all these churches popular. And I'm not dissing people. I'm just preaching the book. I can only preach to you Jesus and him crucified, buried and risen again. He said so. I didn't say it. He said so. Death and discipline are at the door to this church. So we must speak out against immoral teaching. Here's why. Christ will hold us accountable. He moves on to Sardis in the third chapter. Lord have mercy. Do you see the progression? The church that allowed it at his doorstep. The church that allowed it to stay. And then the church that's dead. Sardis is the dead church. He said you have a reputation for being alive. But you are dead. 
He says, wake up from complacency and indifference and routine and ritual and, and, and don't end up in ruin. Be vigilant. Amen. Wake it up. Wake up out of your dream, church. That's what he is saying. I thought about this when I thought about a real world connection. Anybody ever had those dreams in your sleep where you know you sleep but you can't wake up? Yeah. And you're trying to holler, you're trying to yell? Well, I did that once. I did that once. Scared my wife half to death in the dream. I could not wake up. I could, And so literally in the dream, I felt myself screaming. But in reality, I hollered out. I remember looking at her and she had jumped way up in the bed. What is that speaking to us today? Jesus is saying, church, wake up. Open up your mouth and tell somebody about me. Amen. I'm here to tell you I've sat in quite a few over the years. We have followed our kids. We have tried to be faithful. These sports contests, I love to support but I'll be honest with you, they wear me out. Because I see a bunch of folks that will holler and scream about a ref. They will holler and scream at the coaches. They will holler and scream at the players. They will holler and scream and fight one another. And I often think as I sit there quiet and sometimes I'll stand up and wave my arm or I'll point the way the ball is supposed to go. I've done that occasionally. But I often think, what if folks had the same zeal about Jesus and church as they do about sports? What if they opened up their mouths and said something? But yet so many times we come to church and I'm glad y'all a little bit different here. There's a little bit, a little bit different. I'm glad that people open up their mouth. But notice this, don't miss this. You're still dead if you open up your mouth in here. But when you get outside the four walls, you are. You got to tell somebody in the store. You got to tell somebody on the job. You got to tell that family member, Jesus loves you. Jesus is saying, be sensitive to sin. Subject, surrender, there's that word, yourself to my word and repent. Jesus told the Pharisees, you are like whitewashed graves. You look good on the outside, but on the inside there is death. Don't be like Sardis. Moving on to Philadelphia, two left. Jesus calls Philadelphia the faithful church. If we're going to change church, we've got to be faithful. We've got to hold up his word. He, I, lo I love what he says. Just stick with me for just a few more minutes. I'm almost done. Watch this. He says, I know you have little strength, but you have kept my word. What a great, what a great assessment. Hallelujah to the Lamb. I know you don't always feel your best. I know you don't have a lot. I know you don't have a lot going for you. I know you don't have a lot of resources. But here is what you have done. You have kept my word. Help me, Holy Ghost. I know what you have done. I know others have denied my name. But you have kept my word. The Church of Philadelphia was weak in some respects. But they have remained faithful in the face of trial. Can we do that, church? Can we do that? Come on, Bible study folks that were here several years ago when I told you the man passed by me. I didn't even know who he was really on a, at a football game of all places and said, Pastor, I know you just started, but what are you doing to prepare your church for the coming persecution? Amen. What? <laughs> I'm here to watch the football game. What are you talking about, brother? Yeah. What are you saying? I'm saying, and what he was saying, I believe, is that the, as, the, as the Lord tarries before he comes back, the church can go through some things. Amen. The church will go through some difficulties, but keep the word of the Lord. Amen. How do you know this? I look at the early church. I look at the text, and here's where the verses fall into the line, and here we're almost done. Watch this. Acts 4.31. Notice what it says. After John and Peter had, had been commanded to not preach in the name of Jesus, they had been thrown in prison. They go back to the rest of the believers, and they have a Bible study. They have a prayer meeting. They have praise and worship, and here's what happens. 
the Bible says that the place where they were was shaken. And they went out and they spoke the word in boldness. They didn't have a lot. They didn't have degrees. They didn't have letters behind their names. They didn't have all these great resources. But what they did have was a name. And that name is Jesus. They spoke the word with boldness. I don't have letters behind my name. I, I don't have a great resume behind my name. But I got Jesus. And he is what I need. I will. I will bless the Lord at all times. I will preach Jesus. I will tell others about Jesus. How about you? How about you? And finally, this one should be concerning to Laodicea. And I believe if this were considering ages, this is the age we're in. Notice what he says, the lukewarm church. He said, you're neither hot nor cold. You're neither fervent and you're neither cold or just fruitless. You're nothing. You're just in the middle. And because of that, you make me want to vomit. You make me sick. I want to spew you out of my mouth. He says, I wish you were hot or cold. Notice this portion, por portion of the message to the church, if it were concerning age, it is scary because this age is bad. Nobody can really tell unless you're looking carefully who's hot and who's cold. How do you tell that? By looking at God's word. He's speaking to Laodicea. He says, you are hypocrites. You're poor, naked, blind, compromised, Christless. You're without me. And yet I stand, hallelujah, at the door and knock. What's that speak to you today, church? Jesus still wants to come in and sup with you. He wants to come in and have fellowship with you. I believe that this text here, Revelation 3, 14 through 22, greatly shows that in these last days, it is greatly important, it is highly of the utmost importance that you live out a personal relationship with Jesus Christ in front of others for all to see. How do you know this, Pastor? Well, because Matthew 7, 23 said this. Jesus said, in that day, many will stand before me and say, did I not yeah. cast out demons and devils in your name? Yeah. Yeah. Did I not uh, preach in your name? Did I not baptize in your name? Did we not take up dinners in your name? Did we not hand out dinners in your name? Did we not have Sunday school in your name? Did we not put on choir robes and sing songs and sway back and forth in your name? Did we not have your name over the top of the church? Did I not stick your name to the bumper of my car? Did I not put you on my social media post? Did I not put you in my profile? Did I not name my child after you? Did I not do all these things in your name? And Jesus will say, depart from me. I never knew you. Laodiceans. For each church, here it is. Here's the last point of the message. Watch this. For each one of these church, there's a person I believe that fits in this category. I don't know where you are today, but notice this. Jesus spoke to all the churches the same way. Yeah, he spoke to them in love. Some received praise and rebuke. Some received praise and encouragement. And some just received rebuke. But the point is, get this, don't miss it. He spoke to them. Thank you, Lord, that he's still speaking today. Now, in my pitiful little attempts and my poor preaching and poor preparation, here's the good news. Even with how pitiful I can come across, he's still speaking. And I just don't say this so that you can repeat it back at me and, and so that we can have some catchphrase here at Paint Creek. I say it on purpose. You're in the right place at the right time. Why? Because God is speaking. And if he's still speaking, there's still hope. Yes. 
You get to Revelation, the 19th chapter. Go there quickly. There is the church in heaven. So these seven churches, somebody got saved somewhere. And somebody saved in here right now. And somebody is saved around the world. And the Bible says that in the 19th chapter, up until that point, the church is not really spoken of. But in the 19th chapter, we see, we see the church. Look at this. And said, and let us be glad and rejoice in him. Give him glory. Verse 7, for the marriage of the lamb has come. Who is that? The bride and the bridegroom. Who's the bridegroom? Jesus. Who's the bride? The church. That's you and I. And his wife has made herself ready and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And then he said to, to me, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings. Verse 11, jump down. Now I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he that sat on him was called faithful and what? True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. Hallelujah. And he had the name written that no one except himself knew. And his clothes was robed and dipped in blood. And his name was called, hallelujah, the word of God. And the armies of heaven, that's us, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it it should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself will tread the winepress of the fierceness of his wrath, the almighty God, and he has on his robe and on the thigh a name written King of Kings. And Lord of Lords. Church, we will see Jesus as he is. Even though we've been flawed and even though we've messed up and even though we've been like some of these churches that he addresses. Get this. If you know him in the free pardon of your sin, you will see the King of Kings. And the Lord of Lords. How do you know this preacher? Because the description here is given. Amen. That who he was, he looked fierce. He did not look like he looked on that Friday. On that Friday, he was bruised and beaten and battered and whipped and pierced and bleeding in a bloody mess on the cross of Calvary. On the cross of Calvary, our Savior looked like a piece of meat hanging there. But the next time I see him, eyeball to eyeball, he will be the King of Kings. And the Lord of Lords. Anybody going to see him face to face like me? Anybody in here can say, I want to see him. When he comes, I shall see him like he is. And when I see him, I'll be just like him. Yeah. Hallelujah. 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 He is the risen Savior. I don't know about you, but I'm glad he got up on the third day because that gets me up every day. His power, not my power. This past week, I had a rough week, but God brought me this far. Without him, I could do nothing. His power lives in me. His power raises me. His power gives me strength to preach. His power saves from sin. I'm done. Stand to your feet. If you're in here today and you cannot say, I know Jesus in the free pardon of my sins, then we invite you to Christ. And inviting you to Christ is not asking you to come down this aisle and stand here in front of me and say some words. Inviting you to Christ is simply saying, Will you accept him for who he is? Will you surrender your life to him? Will you call on him for salvation? Will you turn to him from sin? Will you forsake everything else and run to him as your savior? There is no other help. 
but in Jesus. You can try all the programs you want. Some of those things can be helpful. I'm not here to say they can't. But only one can save you. I heard a Sunday school teacher say this years ago. They said it this way, and I've never forgotten it. They said, either you can be born twice and die once, or you can be born once and die twice. Now, preacher, what are you saying? You speaking in parables? What's going on? Here's what I'm saying. You can be born twice. You know your birth date. You celebrate it. But do you also know your second birth date? Do you know when you were born again? I just asked somebody that just as late as yesterday. And today I said, do you know when you accepted Jesus as your Savior? When you were born again, Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now, if you're born twice, that means born physically and then born again spiritually through Jesus Christ, then you may die, but you'll only die once. This physical body will go to the ground in one way or the other, but you will only die once. For in heaven, you will be resurrected. Amen. In heaven, you will see Jesus. But if you don't accept his free gift of salvation, you'll only be born once and die twice. You may die here on this side, and then there is the spiritual death. And that spiritual death means in eternity, a separation from God. If you don't believe me, ask the rich man that went to hell, and he looked back and said, Father Abraham, tell my family not to come here. Can you just dip your finger in some water and put it on the tip of my tongue? You will die twice. You will be physically and spiritually separated from God. Amen. Jesus endured that separation for us so that we would not have to. Well, how do you know that, Pastor Scott? He said on the cross of Calvary, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you turned away from me? He took it all for us. Amen. Will you accept him as Savior? Lord, we thank you today. We thank you for your preached word. We thank you for the listening congregation. And Lord, I know your word does not go out and return empty-handed. But it will always accomplish those things which you have set out to do. I know you're working even now by your precious Holy Spirit on the hearts of those who are here and on the hearts of those who are listening at home now and will listen later. Use this word in Jesus' name to bring about a change in the church, to bring about a change in this church. To bring about a change in your people. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. The doors of the church are open. Not by me. Because Jesus opened them well over 2,000 years ago. And for 2,000 years during this church age. He has been speaking to countless hearts. Millions have accepted his offer. And millions have rejected him. Which category are you in today? Is there one? In the soul, cleansing blood of the Lamb, are your garments spotless or they white? Do you know Jesus? Are you washed in the blood? Let's sing it one more time. Are you washed? Are you washed in the blood, my Lord, in the soul, cleansing blood of the Lamb? Only you know that. Are your garments spotless or they white?
Father, we thank you today for all that you are to us. We thank you for your glorious grace, yeah. your magnificent mercy, and your everlasting love. Yes. You have done for us what we could never do for ourselves. I pray today that the word found a heart, found hearts, Lord. It is even now working, working on hearts, Lord, and moving so that someone may draw closer to you. Amen. We pray now for this church in the matchless name of Jesus the Christ that you will continue to bless it, that you will continue to keep it, keep all those who are coming, those who will come. Lord, let it be a place where your love is felt. Help us to learn a message from these previous eight messages, Lord, about change. And Lord, throughout, even though this, the series is over, God, let it not let change not be over in our lives. Lord, for we are changed continually by your word. Yes. Keep us now in Jesus' name. Now may the grace of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit and the love of Christ rest for one abide over each one of us now, henceforth and forevermore. May all of God's children say, Amen. amen. Say amen again. Amen. Hug somebody, tell me glad to see you today. God bless you. Tell them it's good to be in this place. Praise the Lord. Don't forget.